It's Wednesday, March 31st, and this is now on HNN. They do need to hold her to account on that. The Honolulu Police Department is tight-lipped despite a recent deadly shooting, a freeway stabbing, and the murder of a child. I'm like, oh my gosh, they know it. They've been through it how many times? A directive aimed at curtailing COVID in jails is causing problems on the streets and in hospitals. <sighs> Sad, dumb. Um, left in the dark. Plus, today is the day Love's Bakery will close its doors after nearly 170 years in business. These stories and more coming up on This Is Now. Your advice if they're to comply with any of the foregoing terms and conditions of release on bail may mean that the court may revoke the agreement of release and issue a bench warrant for your arrest. You understand? I understand. This just into our newsroom minutes ago. A judge says the suspect in a Kona beating death can be released on a $250,000 bail. Authorities say Benjamin Fleming was not initially the main suspect in this case. He actually called 911 from a vacation rental home early Monday morning and told police his friend was unconscious and drinking alcohol. When officers got to the scene, they determined it was actually a fight between roommates that turned deadly. Fleming and Alexander Germany Wald were both arrested for manslaughter. Germany Wald was considered to be the main suspect at first, but was later released without any charges. Fleming will be back in court next week. We'll have much more on this story coming up on our later editions of H&N and, of course, on our H&N digital platforms. Hey, everyone. We'll good afternoon, and thank you so much for watching This Is Now. Let's get you those latest coronavirus numbers now. The State Department of Health is reporting 100 new cases and one new fatality. The breakdown by island shows 16 cases on the Big Island, one on Kauai, one on Lanai, 30 on Maui, 42 on Oahu, and 10 residents were diagnosed out of state. Kauai County is also independently reporting another two new cases today. The Department of Health is also urging a Maui church to cancel all in-person services because of a large cluster, calling it an imminent health threat. DOH says the cluster from King's Cathedral in Kahului is now at 50 cases, and those infected range in age from 10 to 77 years old. Officials say those who attended events at the church in the past two weeks should get tested for COVID. Meanwhile, we're learning more about the origin of the coronavirus from a new report from the World Health Organization. In a new 120-page report, the World Health Organization outlines their theories into how the coronavirus started spreading around the globe, potentially as early as October 2019, before being detected in Wuhan, China. Don't forget that Wuhan was a major international hub at that time with direct flight every day to most parts of the world. Whether it started in Wuhan or elsewhere in China will need further research, as will the origin of the virus. The report gives four possible sources, direct transmission from an animal, then considered most likely transmission from an intermediate host animal infected by another animal like a bat. Another possible pathway, the virus spreading through frozen food. Another potential source, an accidental leak from a laboratory. Since this was not the key or main focus of uh, the trained studies, uh, it, uh, it did not uh, uh, receive the same depth uh, of attention and work as uh, uh, the other hypotheses. But the WHO says of the four possible pathways, the lab theory was ranked extremely unlikely. Not saying that it was impossible, uh, um, but not the one we would start initially uh, going deeper into. While there is no evidence to support this lab leak theory, the chief of the World Health Organization has called for a further investigation. Now to a story that's making headlines on our H&N digital platforms. While the public had to deal with lockdowns and restrictions, some criminals had more freedom. As investigative reporter Allison Blair found, now many neighborhoods and hospitals are suffering the consequences. Noon mass, a daily ritual. Time for parishioners to take pause cloaked in a sense of comfort and calm. 
But outside Cathedral Basilica of Our Lady of Peace, a lot of fights. There's a community consumed by chaos. One had a knife in his hand, swinging it around. One of the guys got punched, knocked out, cracked his head. For John Fielding, it's just an average Wednesday. I'm going to take his bike, put it inside the uh, storage here at the church. Multiple times we've been uh, broken into. The church volunteer, a professional risk management expert, says during the pandemic, crime and drug use along this section of Fort Street Mall has gotten worse. He's taken dozens of videos. Continue doing your heroin if you like, but I'm going to call the police. It's so bad, he makes it a point to stop by every day. Just to walk around and make sure that everything is safe. Three times a day. Hey, bro. Morning, noon, and night. We're keeping this area clear. Recently, we've had an issue with an individual who's been beating people up. He's talking about Dennis Neopalusu. The 31-year-old has 13 convictions, including two felonies. This individual has assaulted multiple people over the past few days. Two days ago, he literally knocked a woman out. Here's all the police. And you know what they tell us? They can't do anything about it. The state Supreme Court issued a ruling last August that stripped judges of their power to lock up most misdemeanor offenders. The intent was to prevent COVID outbreaks in jail. It's a policy that allows many criminals to go free within hours of their arrest. There's no consequence for their bad behaviors. Dr. Chad Koyanagi works in a psychiatric emergency room. He says since jails aren't an option in a lot of cases, some hospitals are turning into de facto incarceration facilities and staff are getting attacked. Half a dozen staff were injured by a particular individual and I heard that he wasn't even taken into custody. He was released um, back to his family, which is horrifying to me. According to Honolulu police, the number of people taken to Oahu's hospitals for a mental health evaluation since the high court's ruling went into effect is up just slightly compared to the same time period the previous year. But Koyanagi says the patient demographic has changed. It would have a wider range of people who are in crisis, people who are depressed or suicidal or just uh, straight mentally ill. Now the typical MH1 is someone who's using meth, uh, running in the streets, victimizing people. They just sleep it off and a couple days later they just want out. And the cycle of catch and release continues. Earlier this month, Honolulu prosecutor Steve Alm put out a warning to the public about Randy Jacob. The accused serial groper was arrested six times in two weeks, but it wasn't until the 37-year-old grabbed a deputy prosecutor that he was finally taken off the street. Based on what we've seen in this case, we have to give judges more discretion. That series of crimes prompted Om to ask the high court to reverse its August ruling. A decision hasn't come down. Meanwhile, there are plenty more repeat offenders you're not being warned about, like Charles Hanley. His criminal history spans three decades, convicted of assault on a police officer, violating a restraining order, and multiple counts of harassment. But records show lately he's been getting in trouble for setting fires. He's accused of burning a Waikiki hotel room on Halloween. He was arrested again earlier this month for starting another fire behind the Waikiki police substation. We know he wasn't in custody long. Hadley had a run-in with police two weeks later, caught drinking in public. The chance of a catastrophic event in the community is much greater with some of these other individuals who set fires, people who assault bystanders without any kind of provocation. But this is what we're facing. This is what we're dealing with. One week after this video was taken outside Our Lady of Peace, witnesses say New Palusu attacked a 66-year-old woman. She's in a walker, an elderly lady. He randomly comes up to her and he knocks her down. Felony assault, a crime violent enough to finally put him in jail. This is exactly what we're dealing with in downtown Honolulu. And it's a shame. Fielding disgusted, saying it should have never come to this. They're not being held responsible for their actions. I'm like, oh my gosh, they know it. They've been through it how many times? In Honolulu, Allison Blair, Hawaii News Now. HPD remains tight-lipped about several high-profile violent crimes. Lynn Kuano reports on why critics say that's hurting public trust. HPD's own media policy calls for the officer in charge to make public statements, but that has stopped. A man is gunned down on his own driveway in Aiea over the weekend. The attackers are still on the run, but Honolulu police leaders are refusing to do interviews on the case. The public is fearful. 
The neighborhood's probably traumatized. Quell fear. And the best way to do that is through transparency. Chief Susan Ballard also never spoke publicly when an 18-month-old went missing last month in the care of her father, a convicted felon with a violent past. Days later, he was arrested and charged with her murder. And when a man was stabbed to death on the freeway earlier this month, again, nothing from the chief or the homicide unit. Every time we've asked for interviews on recent cases or HPD issues, we were given videos or written statements with no chance for questions or clarification. Last week, under pressure to be more transparent, Ballard offered six media outlets individual interviews with a strictly enforced 10-minute limit. We'll start the clock and then at two minutes we'll give you a warning. Like a speed dating session, reporters were reminded of time ticking down and cut off before all questions were answered. Then I'll just say I'll give you a minute warning for you guys to start wrapping up and then that's it. Victim advocates say the Honolulu Police Commission needs to do more and push the chief to engage the public. The temperature on the stove needs to go up on that. Um, and when Chief Bauer just kind of brushes questions aside to the police commission, which she routinely seems to do, they do need to hold her to account on that. The police commission is expected to release Chief Ballard's annual review next week. So with more on this story, we are joined by Lynn Kuano herself. Lynn, I want to pick it up right where your report left off, talking about that annual review that's pending. What happens if Chief Ballard gets some low marks there? So we are expecting her to get lower marks than she did in the previous years. You know, she got pretty high marks the first year. She was very well revered um, when she first came in. But we do expect it to come down a little bit. In fact, I've spoken to some people who were asked about it, and they um, agree that, that she's going to get lower marks than she has before. But um, really, we have to kind of take these into consideration because there have been past reviews that have been questionable, including Louis Kealoha's, who got exceeds expectations ahead of his arrest and conviction. So whether or not she'll be judged accurately and fairly based on the officers they've spoken to, uh, we shall see. And while we have you here, you have worked at a number of TV markets, working the crime beat. And I wanted to ask you, what's different about how HPD oper operates with giving information to the media compared to other places you've worked? Yeah, when I started my career in Honolulu, it was a great relationship with Honolulu police. When I moved to the mainland, I was really surprised at how much more open they were, especially when I worked in Kansas City, Missouri. They made all kinds of exceptions for the media. They were there to answer questions, especially at a crime scene. And that's what is so disappointing right now with HPD. The acting captain over CID, she has somewhat shut down scene interviews. And when you think about the man who was gunned down on his driveway in Iea this past weekend, how important it could have been for the lieutenant on the scene to say, you know, if anyone saw a car kind of looks like this, you know, either leaving this area or coming to this area where they were coming from, anything like that could have been very helpful in perhaps triggering the public in calling in tips. Instead, we got nothing. Days later, we got nothing. We still have had nothing. Um, the family's calling us. The families of other victims are calling us. It's just a fractured relationship right now. And, and it's, it's puzzling to us because when you have unsolved murders, you have a very unhappy and a very uncomfortable uh, community. And they want to know more about what's going on. All right, Lynn Kuano, thank you for joining us. Let's toss it back over to Ashley. The teenage cashier who took a counterfeit $20 bill from George Floyd shortly before he was killed last May testified in the Derek Chauvin trial. Christopher Martin says he thought Floyd appeared to be under the influence and possibly unaware that the 20 was fake, so Martin offered to pay out of his own paycheck. Instead, the manager called police and Martin watched the deadly arrest. Uh, disbelief, thank you. Why guilt? Um, if I would have just not taken the bill, this could have been avoided. Tuesday's witnesses included another teenager, Darnella Frazier, who recorded the widely seen video of Floyd's death. It's the night I stayed up apologizing and, and apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more and not physically interacting and not saving his life. Derek Chauvin's defense has tried to prove that the on-scene witnesses were a potential threat to officers and might have distracted them from arresting Floyd. They called him a bum at least 13 times. 
That's what you counted in the video? That's what I counted. And that's what you got, 13. Chauvin faces up to 40 years in prison if convicted of the most serious charge against him. Pfizer says its COVID-19 vaccine is effective in adolescents. The pharmaceutical company says clinical trial results showed 100% efficacy in youths ages 12 to 15. Results also found the age group tolerated the dose as well. Researchers say there were no COVID-19 cases among the more than 1,000 participants given the vaccine. The data has yet to be peer-reviewed. Pfizer is planning to submit its results to the Food and Drug Administration as soon as possible to expand the emergency use authorization. The COVID-19 vaccine is currently authorized in the U.S. for people ages 16 and older. Love's Bakery is closing its doors for good today after nearly 170 years in business. Billy V has more on the historic day. Thank you very much. We're here in the thrift store, which is located right next to the factory of Love's Bakery in Kalihi. We're taking a look at one of the last loaves that uh, you'll be able to see on the shelves. Already you can see that there's bread out here this morning on this final day where bread is on sale, but you can see that the shelves are starting to go kind of bare and empty. There are people like Carol who was here loading up loaves of bread. Carol lives in Makiki, but the reason why she was picking it up is because that she is going to be taking them to their church where they make sandwiches for IHS and the homeless. She says she doesn't know what they're going to do after Loves is gone. We also talked to some of the workers here who didn't want to say their name, but they just all sing the same thing today. Sad. <sighs> Sad, um, um, left in the dark because the company not really telling us what's going on. I mean, I got little answers yesterday from the president, but not nothing near you know, what we want to hear, you know. What's it look like on the inside? Empty. I mean, all torn apart, quiet. Ghosts. You know, nobody likes to see this happen. Nobody likes lose their jobs. And then, of course, they were waving signs this morning at 9 a.m. to thank the community. In the meantime, in the thrift store, Jade is at the cash register, and she's got a smile on her face because she's one of the ambassadors of Love's, being here every day for over 20 years. Today is her last day as well, but she's greeting customers, smiling as she goes, just like she's done, bringing smiles to people, just like Love's has done for almost 170 years. On this final day from Kalihi, I'm Billy V for This Is Now. Thanks, Billy, for that update. Certainly that door was busy there. We mm -hmm. have kept hearing that doorbell ring. Wanted to mention that Loves, the brand, is going to stick around. It's the brick and mortar that we're going to see go away. The brand has reached a licensing deal, so we'll see some products still on the shelf with that logo in time to come. Let's take you outside live video feed coming in from Aloha Tower. Looking beautiful out there, but will the weather remain this way? Here's Guy Hoggy. How's it on this Wednesday? Trade winds will be uh, running at steady speeds for the next couple of days, getting even stronger as we head into the weekend. And uh, they'll be pushing in a few wind and and showers, but upstream moisture is minimal. We do have some mid-level clouds pushing over the state. They might block the sunshine to a little extent, but really we still are expecting a fair bit of sunshine, especially for leeward areas. And with those trade winds blowing in, conditions will be comfortable. Now keep in mind, the one outlier, of course, the corner side of the Big Island, they'll have light winds all day long, and that will lead to some afternoon cloud buildups. Now the surf's looking up in the country, not a big swell, a little boost coming in. And that a nice swell rolling into the south shore, well, it's on the decline. East shore is running a little on the smaller side, but expected to get bigger because the trade winds will begin uh, will begin picking up uh, and uh, producing a larger trade wind swell over the next several days. So again, steady trade winds through Friday, getting stronger as we head into the weekend. The next best chance for more significant rainfall, it looks like between Sunday and Monday. Keep it here on Hawaii News Now. We'll have all your severe weather updates. Are you priced out of paradise? The dream of home ownership seems more and more distant for many. Casey Lund is joined by an expert with an update on the housing market. Uh, we want to get right to Jason Lazzarini. He's the CEO of Locations. Jason, I want to thank you for being with us and I want to get right to this. We've talked about the market and what's happening. I want to talk about inventory. Where are we seeing uh, the biggest decreases in inventory here in Oahu and, and what's happening? Paint a picture for us. 
Well, inventory has been a problem in our market for years, and um, it's just really at unprecedented levels right now. So right now there's 450 homes for sale, um, single family homes for sale across the market, and that's for a population of a million people. So it's across every single neighborhood, inventory is down. And as you said, it, it's definitely different by neighborhood and it has a lot to do with price, but it's, it's a problem across the island. It has a lot to do with um, interest rates and of course, just the lack of inventory that's historical in our market. So I also want to talk about some bright spots. Where are we seeing um, some opportunity? What neighborhoods are uh, you kind of pointing people towards or um, where, where people are finding success, uh, even though it's extremely competitive? Right. Well, there are some neighborhoods where there are, there are opportunities. So in, in the urban corridor, I would say from Manoa, there's, Manoa is only 4% down year over year. New Uwana Makiki is down about 23%. And those are both in the higher price band. So if, if you're looking in the more moderate price band, West Honolulu has some opportunities, and that's from Kalihi to Salt Lake. On the other end of the extreme, the west side is extremely tight. You're looking at Leeward, Makakilo, Eva, those are down 76, 75% year over year. So it has a lot to do with region, has a lot to do with price. So uh, in the, yeah, on the west side where you think maybe homes are a little bit more affordable, I can see why, why it's really competitive there. I wanna ask you about um, what it's like to be a seller right now though in this market. Uh, tell us some good news for those folks. Yeah, it's a good day to be a seller. I'll say that if you put your home on the market right now, it's likely you're the only person in your neighborhood with a home on the market. And that's a very good thing. Nearly half of the homes that are sold right now are, are sold over asking price. They're bid up in, in these bidding wars. So that, that bodes well for you if you're a seller. It's also one of those moments where things are going to go very fast. The average days on market are 10 days. So if you put your home for sale and you're thinking about moving up or downsizing, this is a fantastic opportunity to take advantage of, of a really unusual market. So when is the internet not talking about Spike Seltzer, really? <laughs> yeah. Well, most country stars talk about whiskey or beer or maybe their truck or tractor, but Blake Shelton is getting into the booze game with vodka. Oh. Yep, that's right. The country music star is launching his new line of hard lemonades. The singer partnered with Smith Works Vodka to create these drinks, which I don't have the name. I guess it just goes under Smith Works. Uh, they come in flavors like lemon, strawberry, peach tea, and crisp lime. Uh, Shelton said they're perfect for kicking back on a summer day. You like the branding? Mm, a like little busy? Yeah, I like the tractor. <laughs> I mean, I know it's hard to get into spiked seltzer game yeah, these days, right? Yeah, I don't like the hard lemonades. They're way too sweet. Yeah, I had one that was very sweet, mm -hmm. the Mike's. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So Britney Spears is sharing her thoughts about that documentary about her life. So the pop star told Instagram or posted on Instagram that the film Framing Britney Spears brought her to tears for two weeks. She said it left her embarrassed. The documentary, which was released in February, detailed her career and high profile conservatorship battle with her father, Jamie Spears, who has legal power over her finances and personal affairs. Brittany was not interviewed for the documentary. Yeah, we both watched it. Yeah. It was a very compelling documentary there that really goes into a lot of depth of what she has been dealing with over the years. I just watched the Tina Turner documentary on HBO. Oh. Two hours of Tina Turner uh -huh. there. It was good. Um, if I was going to say which celebrity documentary is better, the Britney one. But I'm a huge Tina Turner fan as well. But it goes through her history, who's went through just a incredible career and it really the cool thing about that one is it goes into her performances with some amazing archive clips oh, as love well it. yeah that's gonna do it for this is now and that was my documentary review of pop stars <laughs> uh we'll be back here tomorrow so glad to have ashley back you guys we'll see you then bye